on World News Tonight. A big win. The Senate voted on a historic bill that put President Biden and Democrats on a huge victory. Nuclear catastrophe. Warnings given for an impending doom as explosions reported at a nuclear plant. Non-stop attacks. A ceasefire was declared in the Middle East after days of attacks between Israel and Palestinian militants. And it's plastic art. South Korea opens an exhibition with a course of promoting climate change. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now, China continues to send aircrafts and warships near Taiwan in what it says are combined military drills. And what Taiwan says is a rehearsal for an attack. Before the end of a four-day of unprecedented Chinese military exercises launched in reaction to a visit to Taiwan by U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. A game of cat and mouse on the high seas. Chinese and Taiwanese warships sailed at close quarters in the Taiwanese Strait on Sunday as unprecedented Chinese military exercises launched in reaction to a visit to Taiwan by U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi were due to end. Pelosi's visit last week infuriated China, which regards the self-ruled island as its territory. China responded by test-launching ballistic missiles over Taiwan's capital and cutting off some areas of dialogue with Washington. Taiwan's defense ministry on Sunday said it had detected 14 Chinese warships, 66 Chinese aircraft and drones in and around the Taiwan Strait. It said the vehicles were simulating attacks on the island and its navy, adding that the defense ministry had sent aircraft and ships to react appropriately. It was not immediately clear if China had ended the drills midday on Sunday, as previously announced. Chinese state television footage showed the military dispatching various types of multi-type fighter jets over the water. And CCTV reported that the military will, from now on, conduct regular drills on the eastern side of the median line of the Taiwan Strait. It took every Democratic senator and vice president of the United States to do it. And President of the United States and his party are celebrating the passage of a legislation of Inflation Reduction Act, while Republicans are warning it will hurt the economy and not help. The vote came after a marathon weekend for senators and an all-nighter. The end result would be the biggest government expenditure ever approved to fight climate change. It's been a long time in coming. An evening of celebration for Democrats. Passing their signature health care, economic and climate bill after an all night marathon of procedural votes that stretched well into Sunday afternoon. And vote after vote after vote. Uh, we have done this with no sleep. Vice President Kamala Harris breaking a tie on the bill that boasts more than $300 billion in climate funding. The boldest clean energy package in American history. Also allowing Medicare to directly negotiate with drug companies, which can lower the cost of prescription drugs for seniors. And raising the corporate minimum tax to 15% for companies worth over $1 billion. All Democrats voting for it, even if they wished it did more. President Biden finally leaving isolation today after his second negative COVID test, applauding the bill as an example of what he ran for president to do, make government work for working families again. The linchpin senators at the center of these talks, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, celebrating the win and earning praise for their work. Republicans, meanwhile, unified in opposition, warning about spending against the current economic backdrop, also cutting a provision that would have capped insulin prices for Americans not on Medicare. Life-saving medicines don't do any good if people can't afford them. Still, Democrats energized by the victory. What does this mean for the nation? Uh, we'll see. Regardless of an election, that the American people are being seen and they're seen and they're being heard. Now, House Democrats on deck, set to return from their August recess Friday to pass the bill before sending it to President Biden's desk. More than 4,000 undocumented migrants have arrived in New York City since May. Texas Governor Greg Abbott says the border states are done shouldering Americans' immigration crisis, so he's sending them to so-called sanctuary cities. Meanwhile, New York City Mayor is fighting back at the move as shelters are already overrun. Driven by bus and fueled by politics, another wave of migrants arrived in New York City today. Este merecemos una oportunidad. 
More than 4,000 have come since May, a metaphorical message from Texas Governor Greg Abbott. New York's mayor is furious, saying shelters are already overrun. Placing on the bus with no direction to come here. But tonight, Abbott is adamant border states are done shouldering America's immigration crisis after May saw a record 239,000 illegal crossings. The governor slammed President Biden Friday for refusing to do his job and called New York, a sanctuary city, the ideal destination for migrants, adding he also sent 5,500 to Washington, D.C., that city's mayor pleading for federal aid. And we need our National Guard. If we were a state, I would have already done it. The feds denied that request, adding to the chaos faulty paperwork. According to one migrant claiming an immigration and customs enforcement officer in Texas gave him government documents showing a made-up address, phone number, and a smiley face instead of a signature. ICE vowing to investigate, adding it takes allegations of inappropriate behavior very seriously. Meanwhile, families are caught in the fray. Ruben, his wife, and four kids fled Colombia and nearly drowned crossing the border. Tonight, thousands seeking asylum met with divisive politics and loaded bus tickets. In Ukraine, there are growing fears over attacks on the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, with experts warning that shelling there could lead to a catastrophe. Tonight, global alarm over explosions at Europe's largest nuclear power plants, now operating under Russian control. The weakened rocket attack destroying high-voltage wires, forcing Ukrainian workers to limit output at one of the plant's six reactors. Ukraine says the risk of hitting the Zaporizhia plant, nearly twice the size of Chernobyl, is allowing Russia to shell cities without retaliation. Ukraine's president outraged. This is the largest nuclear power plant on our continent, and any shelling of this factory is an open, brazen crime, an act of terror. But Russia released this video today, claiming to show damage inflicted by Ukrainian forces. Nearby shelling so intense, inspectors fear they can't assess the damage. Israel and Palestinian Islamic Jihad militant group declared a truce, raising hopes of an end of the most serious flare-up on the Gaza frontier in more than a year. An end in sight to the deadliest conflict in Gaza City this year. Warring factions spoke of ceasefire on Sunday after three days of intense fighting, sparked by the Israeli military targeting Islamic Jihad positions. Palestinian authorities say that over 40 people have been killed in the latest strikes, with many of the victims women and children. Israel has responded, blaming some of the deaths on misfired Palestinian rockets. More than 300 locals have meanwhile been wounded in the fighting, with several buildings reduced to rubble. I was running, didn't know what to do. People started to come and rescue residents from the building next to me. I was saying the last prayers. I didn't expect to live. I didn't expect to live until the moment they rescued me. Talks of a truce come after Israel's army say it repelled a barrage of rockets from Gaza and neutralized the entire senior leadership of Islamic Jihad's military wing. This included a key commander of the Iran-backed group, allegedly killed in a crowded refugee camp through a targeted attack. Earlier on Sunday, two Islamic Jihad rockets were reportedly fired at Jerusalem before being intercepted. Air raid sirens sounded in the holy city as hundreds of Jews gathered to venerate at a sacred site. Rather than getting involved in the latest conflict, Gaza's ruling Hamas group has decided to stay on the sidelines, fearing to undo any economic understanding made with Israel following the 11-day war in May last year. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, Colombia's first leftist president was sworn into office, promising to fight inequality and heralding a turning point in the history of a country haunted by long war between the government and guerrilla groups. Thousands filled the streets of central Bogota on Sunday as the country marked a historic shift. As Gustavo Petro, an ex-guerrilla and former senator, was sworn in as the country's first leftist president in history. I swear to God and promise to the people to faithfully comply with the constitution 
and the laws of Colombia. The 62-year-old won office after defeating populist opponent Rodolfo Hernandez in a runoff election in June. A remarkable victory in a country where left-wing politicians are often accused of being soft on crime. Petro has vowed to reshape the country with a swathe of social reforms to tackle the country's economic inequality and drug violence. Among them, he's pledged to fight climate change and unite crime gangs and leftist rebels. And many Colombians are eager to see what change could bring. For the first time in 200 years, a ruler who was elected by the people and for the people takes office. We have high expectations. We've been waiting for this change for so long. The elite has always governed us. For Colombian society, this is a huge change. Another historic change for this new presidency is Petro's right-hand woman. As his vice president, Francia Marquez, is the first ever Afro-Colombian female in the role. It's estimated that around 40% of the country's 50 million population live in poverty, and inflation reached 10.2% in July. Flanked by cheering crowds, the front runners in Kenya's presidential election made their final push for voters under tight security, capping months of frenzy campaigning ahead of the August 9th polls. The top two contenders to be Kenya's next president held their final rallies on Saturday as months of frenetic campaigning came to an end. Deputy President William Ruto and veteran opposition leader Raila Odinga will go head to head in Tuesday's election in what is set to be a tight vote. Kenya's next leader will have to face ballooning debt and a cost of living crisis. Ruto has pledged to reduce borrowing and stimulate small enterprises to help drive growth and generate revenue. On Tuesday, the people of Kenya will prevail over the deep state. The people of Kenya will prevail over the system and we are going to have a nation that leaves no Kenyan behind. A message that resonates with his supporters. You know, life has become very hard for us. At the moment, as you can see, there's no flood, there's no, there's no everything in the country. But for me, I was hoping if Ruto is going to be the fifth president of this country, everything is going to change. Odinga, who is incumbent president, Uhuru Kenyatta, and his Kenya Kwanzaa party's preferred successor, has pledged to renegotiate terms for the debt. He says this will free up cash to fund social interventions and development. Let my people go. Today I repeat the same declaration. Let my people go. Free them from bondage of thieves. Free them from the bondage of liars and free them from the chain, chain links of corruption. Kenya's economic output has more than doubled during Kenyatta's 10 years in office. But a debt binge that fueled growth and investment could cramp his successor's ability to tackle growing hunger and soaring prices. Now there are more than 7,500 probable or confirmed monkeypox cases in the United States and the latest case was an Illinois daycare worker. However, no other cases have been reported there. Officials did not say how many children might have been exposed to the virus. Tonight in rural Illinois, alarm bells over the possible exposure of young children to monkeypox. What's it like to hear about monkeypox in a daycare? It's scary. It really is. I just worry. I hope that doesn't affect the kids in school again. Parents in the small town of Rantoul learning a local daycare worker tested positive, the third known case in the county. State health officials declined to name the facility, but vowed Friday to screen every child at risk. If your child has had the potential of being exposed in this outbreak, you will receive a call from Champaign-Urbana Public Health District. Uh, you do not need to call daycare centers. The Illinois scare, just the latest flashpoint amid mounting monkeypox concerns. The White House this week declaring it a public health emergency. The CDC now tracking more than 7,500 cases. The largest outbreaks in New York, California, and Florida. Montana announcing its first case, leaving Wyoming the only state untouched. The Biden administration under growing pressure for more monkeypox vaccines, which remain in short supply. 
we are going to quickly ramp up uh, vaccine manufacturing here in the U.S. and elsewhere. Officials also noting the painful, blistering virus, which often spreads through skin-to-skin -skin contact, has primarily impacted men who have sex with men, the risk looming over LGBTQ festivals like this weekend's Market Days in Chicago. I've changed a lot of plans. I've had a lot of friends change plans. But in Rantoul right now, the concern is if the virus spreads to children, which thankfully so far has been rare. We have some good news for you. The Metaverse is a place where people interact in virtual space through headset technology. And now universities are also using this technology as a tool to learn anatomy, replacing the traditional, more costly method of cadavers. Mark Griswold may appear to be by himself, but this Case Western Reserve professor is not alone. So this is a brain simulation of a patient. This is the virtual room Griswold is in. And those three blue heads around him, they are avatars for world-class surgeons. I'm in Durham, North Carolina right now. I'm in Western Mass on vacation. And I'm in Dublin, Ireland at a meeting. They're thousands of miles apart, but together they're working to revolutionize healthcare as they gather around a 3D rendering of a brain to map out a complex surgery. This kind of consultation used to take days of video calls. Now, using HoloLens technology from Microsoft, it takes perhaps an hour. It's a new way to teach anatomy that doesn't involve costly cadavers. At Case Western Reserve School of Medicine, researchers have found these virtual models help medical students learn twice as fast and keep the knowledge longer. It's awesome. I think it's like one of the things about studying anatomy is really seeing exactly how it lays in space. And I don't know that I ever would have gotten that without a like virtual reality experience. And as this technology becomes more widely available, so will this knowledge, even beyond medical school. So here we're just looking at the muscular system. For developing nations, community colleges, even nursing programs where this sort of training may have been off limits, now virtual learning is democratizing what has been an elite understanding of the human body. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. South Korean auto giant Hyundai Motors and its affiliate Kia Motors in the first half of this year exported more than 200,000 eco-friendly vehicles for the first time. In Cuba, firefighters are battling a large fire at an oil depot. The Cuban city of Matazanas is battling a blaze that started at an oil storage depot on Friday. The fire started when one of the eight storage tanks at the facility was stuck by lightning. Following his rebound infection, U.S. President Joe Biden has tested negative COVID-19. Biden left his White House isolation for the first time in two weeks after news of his test results. Mongolia has voiced its firm support to China's development and the One China principle. At a meeting, Mongolian Prime Minister said Mongolia firmly believes that respect should be paid to all countries' independence, sovereignty and torrential integrity as well as their independent choice of development path. Hong Kong will shorten the mandatory COVID-19 hotel quarantine period for all arrivals to three days from seven. Arrivals will need to self-monitor for a further four days, during which they will be barred from such premises as restaurants and bars. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we air tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, let's take a look at how South Korea created art by plastic waste to spread awareness of how climate change can affect the world. Stay safe and have a good night.